I felt that something else was holding me, something bigger than me. And I saw this golden color. We flashed our lights like the legend says to, and we've seen the light come up down the road. I felt this incredible energy come over me, and it was Lee Sung. From the boundaries of the universe to the depth of your soul. Embark on a journey through the unknown and unexplained as we explore mysteries, magic, and miracles. People have claimed possession by spirits since the time of the apostles. Are they acting alone or are they guided by another presence? Let's see if we can find some explanations. Throughout history, angels have been an integral part of many different religions. Artists have portrayed the heavenly beings as caring spirits, messengers of God, and protectors of humankind. Today, more and more people are becoming aware of the angelic presence in their lives. One person who sensed an angel presence in her life and responded to it is Bridget Fonger, who opened an angel store in Pasadena. I believe that throughout my life I've had angel experiences. Now looking back, and I think that all of us have, it's just a matter of being aware of what, what that is. Some people call it synchronicity, some people call it a religious experience, some people call it, you know, this just this weird thing happened to me, or some people call it ghosts or spirits or talking with the other side. And Do you think people really believe in angels? Children believe in angels. And most of the time, people never really lose that belief. It gets covered up or they forget. But now, angels are coming back into mainstream and uh, social, socially acceptable thinking. We interviewed Karen Goldman, who has written books on angels. When angels came to me as a topic, it started just by exploring what an angel is from within. Um, I started getting answers about how everything connects. And, you know, angels as a symbol, everything we know about angels is that they can appear on Earth. They're also heaven from heaven. Um, they're with people when they die. Um, they transcend all the worlds. They're kind of, they're messengers between the light and the dark. And this woman named Joanne, Karen told us a story about a woman named Joanne, who was a foster parent for young children and babies. She said that from a sound sleep, she, a bright light woke her up, and she heard a voice say, Joanne, get up and sit at the foot of the bed. So she, it woke her up. She immediately picked up the baby, got up, and sat at the foot of the bed. And as soon as she got to the foot of the bed and sat down, there was a tremendous earthquake. <laughs> and glass from a great big window that was beside the bed shattered and fell all over the bed and would have cut herself and the baby. We visited Bridget Fonger's angel store to see what sort of angels we could find there. You really do have every kind of angel here. I try. <laughs> Why did you open the store? Um, I had a series of sort of angelic experiences, and the first of which was my little friend he, um, died last year when he was two and a half. His name was Gavin Murray. And he was like a living angel. And when he was alive, I always, I made a lot of angel paintings for him. He died of cancer. He was a big inspiration for the story, and I have felt his presence a lot. Bridget, I've never seen a pair of angel wings this big. Where'd you get these? These wings are the result of one of the hundreds of synchronistic events that went to the opening of this store. Um, I was shopping one day and I saw this man across the room and he had these rare Indian beads on. And at one point he looked over and I took that as an invitation to ask him about these beads because they're very rare, special beads. And I said, did you get those in India? And he said, yeah. Have you been to India? And I said, yeah, several times. And he said, were you there in 1989? And I said, Yes, and he said, I remember you. And we had been at the same ashram in 1989, and he remembered me. I didn't remember him. But anyway, he, um, 
we started talking at the end of our conversation. I handed him my car at the Angel Store, and he said, Angel Store, I was just on the phone about my angel wings. And I said, you're what? And he said, because I'd been looking for angel wings for the store, and he said, yeah, let's put them in your store. I made these wings for Sharon Stone for the cover of Premier Magazine. They're really beautiful. I'm sure you'll love them, and, and everybody loves them. I had... Bridget told us about a time when her back had locked and she arranged for a professional massage to ease the pain. was locked. She came to my house and she did shiatsu and it was an amazing experience and as the massage was going on, I was becoming, my back was unlocking and... I was working on Bridget and as I was on the side of her body, I began to kind of see in my mind's eye this feminine presence. It was an amazing massage and I felt that I was healing as it was going on but I was thinking god is this all of this pain gonna go away because it seemed like a lot that she was gonna have to do I just let it be there for a while and I uh, wasn't going to say anything about it I was just gonna move along and continue my healing work on her body um, but it stayed with me for quite a while she was holding me in a way and I felt that something else was holding me, something bigger than me. And I saw this golden color. This glowing kind of hair, golden. It, was, it looked like hair, but maybe it wasn't hair. It just had that image because it was very long and it flowed outward. But the most extraordinary part of the massage was at the end, um, Laura was sort of finishing up and had her hands on my head and neck area. And she pulled her hands away and I felt her pull her hands away and then I felt another pair of hands come into the same place where her hands had just been and they weren't her hands but I didn't want to say those aren't your hands are they because I felt like either it would ruin if it was something like different or she would say oh yeah they are my hands are, are you crazy <laughs> I let it be there for a while because I didn't want to, I wasn't going to say anything to Bridget and disturb her and I didn't really know how open she'd be to anything like that going on. I wasn't even sure how open I was at that moment. And I saw that same golden light that I had seen and then I saw this like deep bright pink and deep bright blue and it was like there was like an enormous woman standing above me. And then it started to retract, it started to pull back up and through me and then recede a little bit. And at that point, I decided I was going to, I thought, I'm going to have to tell Bridget what's going on. So I said, Bridget, I said, I don't know if I should tell you this or, but I felt this feminine energy working on you. And some dress or a rush of intense colors stories and she says well what kind of blue was it really in it and I said yeah it was intense blue and it was it wasn't like a, a, a really intense pink and we just kind of went back and forth on the details of what we had experienced and it was neither of us was making up any of it and we were just sort of understanding that this thing that I thought had happened and that she thought had happened had truly happened. It changes the way you see everything. You see the magic in all things and, and life isn't ordinary and that no matter how solid or how real the world can get on the freeways or any of these things, you begin to see that there's truly magic behind every door, behind everything. Omni magazine recently reported the famous photo of the Loch Ness Monster taken in 1934 to be a hoax. Christian Sperling confessed to his role as builder of the famous sea monster before his death at age 90. He said he made Nessie using a toy submarine fitted with a serpent's neck and head. Sperling got the idea from his stepfather, a filmmaker hired by a newspaper to find the Loch Ness Monster in 1933. A family friend, an eminent London physician, took the photograph. Since the conspirators are no longer living, there's no way to verify the story, leaving just enough doubt for people to go on believing. 
A shimmering light in the cornfield of a small Indiana farm has caused a stir among residents for decades. The players are a farmer, his son, and a murderer. The setting, a mysterious light that glows when beckoned. Documented home video footage sets the stage for this ghostly tale. Rensselaer, Indiana, a small farming community just 80 miles south of Chicago, known for its vast landscape and humble tranquility. It is also the site of one of the greatest unexplained mysteries of the century. Legend has it that Farmer Moody was chasing after his son's abductor in the darkness, guided solely by the light of his lantern from his tractor. After a gallant chase, the man escaped, leaving Moody's dead son behind. Out of despair, Moody hung himself. And he happened to hang himself right here on this particular tree. It's now a tree stump. Three flicks of your car lights is said to summon the spirit of Moody and his bright lantern light. Witness Bob Lemire recalls his own experience. And I've seen the light myself coming out here. I've seen it. We've came out here and we flashed our lights like the legend says to. And we've seen the light come up down the road, get bright, and then seem to taper off as we went down the road. Lemire's startling home video footage documents his sightings. As he and his friend John approach the stump, they flick their lights three times. Witnesses claim the light can even appear at will as it did here. The two lights on the right are known objects, while the one on the left appears much closer. After a few minutes, they notice something strange. The light vanishes. A few moments later, it reappears much brighter. After hearing Lemire's story, we decided to investigate. The first step was to call Moody with our car lights. So go ahead, flick it three times. Now let's look in the distance and see if anything happens. Unfortunately, nothing was seen after several minutes. We tried again. Then it happened. A light from the cornfield appeared in the darkness. You can see it in the upper left-hand corner of your screen as our cameraman tried to zero in on it. We have circled it for easier identification. The light appears to be in the sky, but I assure you this is ground level. As you saw, we went from total blackness to the sudden appearance of this strange light. It was time to get a closer view of our findings. What we've got here that could be one logical explanation is this particular stop sign right here. This thing here gave sort of a, a reddish glow from about a mile and a quarter down. These other signs at the end of the road could have reflected light as well, but I was wondering where the source of a known light could have been. There was nothing out here. I mean, this is, this is absolutely endless. There, there's absolutely nothing out here whatsoever besides this. Upon returning to the tree stump, we were amazed at the amount of spectators gathered to see Moody's light. Among them was another witness with an even closer encounter. So this gentleman, Doug, over here just told me a story that he was here last night. What did you see last night? Um, right up by the side of the road, there was a little body with a lantern just walking around, looking on the side of the road. You could see the whole outline of the body. It was bright yellow, and so was the lantern. Really? Whatever skeptics may say, we were there, and we saw this light appear from an origin not one of us could trace. The glow of Moody's light will continue to be one of our greatest mysteries. You've heard of the Bible, the Quran, and the Torah. But there is another book that claims to shed new light on the origins of the universe. In the Arantia book, Adam and Eve were not the first humans. And the Earth was not initially ruled by God. In fact, two other humans, Andon and Fonta, appeared 60,000 years before Adam and Eve. But they were ruled by Satan. The book also claims that Jesus of Nazareth was the human form of a much more sovereign being named Michael of Nebadon. It pinpoints the birth of Jesus on August the 27th, 7 BC, and the crucifixion on April the 7th, 30 AD, with the ascension two days later. To tap into spirits from another dimension, psychics, I have a good friend as a psychic, can act as conductors to channel information. Each of us has the ability to reach a higher power, 
but we don't even realize it. From ancient times until today, many kinds of people have channeled, but they are known by different names. Medium, healer, witch doctor, fortune teller, guru, and prophet. In the San Francisco Bay Area, Professor John Klimo co-directs the doctoral parapsychology program at Rosebridge Graduate School, one of only four universities in the world dedicated to the study of anomalous phenomena. He is also co-founder of OPUS, the Organization for Paranormal Understanding and Support that helps people who have unusual personal experiences. He is considered an expert in channeling. What is channeling? I define channeling as receiving energy or information or guidance from some source other than oneself and originating from some level of reality other than the physical as we currently understand it. I, I guess my roots, uh, not only uh, uh, with regard to channeling, but to most paranormal or inexplicable fields in general, all of which I, I'm fascinated by and see as interconnected, began uh, for me as an artist and a poet. Way back in my teenage years, or even earlier, when I was doing paintings and creative writing and poetry, I would feel myself moving into these altered states of consciousness. I'd feel myself getting more and more inspired and the more inspired I got, the more I, I, I felt, I wondered, where is this coming from? This isn't just me anymore. When I would kind of get in the saddle of the inspired moment, I was connected to other wavelengths, other worlds. Alan Vaughn is a psychic researcher or professional intuitive. He uses his talents in psychic archaeology to discover ancient ruins and in research experiments on psychic phenomena. But he also has the ability to channel an entity from another time. I went to a number of mediums uh, to see what they could say about me. Three of them said that I would be doing channeling myself one day and gave me the name of this Chinese entity, Li Sung. Well, my response was over my dead body. I felt this incredible energy come over me. And it was Li Sung. There's what I would call full trance or unconscious channeling, where the channel goes away or goes unconscious and then comes back after the experience has occurred and doesn't have recall. I channel in a trance. It's like listening to a distant radio, as uh, Jane Roberts once said. I experience it very similarly. Uh, but Lee Sung shows me pictures of everything uh, he's talking about. And then he uh, impresses me. He's like standing behind me. And he impresses me so that it all comes out in English. What I call in my book open channeling, it's the kind of thing that I do. I don't lose consciousness. I don't stop being myself. And as far as I'm aware, there is not a particular identifiable entity that's, that's talking to me, that's working through me. Uh, so far as I know, it's still me, but it's more than me. Um, uh, good uh, day, my uh, friends. Oh, we are most pleased to be in your lights. I do feel I connect to the universal. Well, we lived um, about uh, 1,200 years ago by your time in a small village in northern China. The more I get carried away, the more I open up into this, the more I feel like I am an individuation of God in human form, letting more and more of that awakeness and realization pour through me. And as it pours through me, the language picks up faster and faster. I'm grabbing at, at, at hunks of sentences and metaphors and images popping to me. I, I'm sort of like clairvoyantly seeing all these images. Uh, we uh, counseled uh, persons who had, well, both physical and emotional problems. Uh, and we prescribed uh, herbs and we did some therapy with them. But that there's something larger, a presence pushing to come through this person. And that, that presence is not just that person. to help people understand their past lives, their soul's purpose, how they may enrich their living with spiritual principles in everyday life. We individual human beings have been kept down so long by government, by authorities, by churches, by science, and told, you're only this, you're only this, you're only this. The bottom line of all channeling for me is no, no, we are we are capable of channeling, of accessing the universal. There can be danger in whom you connect to in the channeling process, and there can be danger in your own psychological strengths. Many people have the will to believe. I have the will to believe. Skeptics have the will to disbelieve. And in, and in parapsychology, there's two camps, the sheeps and the goats. The goats are those that don't believe. 
the sheep are those that tend to believe. For me, the ultimate channeling is to channel God, the universal creator, creation, being, mother, father, as Lazara says, God, goddess, all that is. I think we're capable of connecting with all that is. As you incorporate more of the higher teachings into your understanding, then you're also able to teach others. So there must be spreading across the planet this consciousness of spirituality, of hope, and of creating miracles. Heaven is within us, and that we are, we are potentially all channels in that we are all able to connect to universal heart and mind and wisdom and energy and, and, um, and be representatives of our creator. The next time you experience a strange occurrence or an unearthly presence, Take comfort in knowing that you are not the only one. Mysteries happen every day, everywhere. I'm Patrick McNee. Please join us next time for Mysteries, Magic, and Miracles.